to start. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our AFBE leadership talk session. This will be the last for the year 2021. 2021 has been a very good year to us at the leadership group and AFBE UK and AFBE Scotland as a whole. We have seen very huge changes. We have seen progress. We have seen development in the year 2021. And it's all possible due to the many of you who always attend our various shows and support us and encourage us, including all our partners. So we say thank you very much as we come to the end of the year. Now with me, I have my co-hosts, um, Uluwa Bumi. Thank you very much for, for joining us. And a very special guest that we have with us. She is what I typically refer to as the kind of person you reference when you are talking or writing an article or anything like that. She is Carmen Morris. She is the managing director and founder of Kenro Consulting. She's a global provider of bespoke diversity and inclusion solutions um, to, to, to organizations across the UK, the US and Canada. She has nearly 30 years worth of practice in the field of diversity, equity and inclusion. She's also a former Forbes contributor. She's written amazing articles, which I would recommend that once you just type her name on Google, it'll probably be about the first or second thing that comes up. She is a mother and she's a wife and she's here to speak with us today on smashing that glass ceiling and concrete wall as we step into 2022. Carmen, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks so much and thanks for such a, a great introduction there, Roy. <laughs> Right, so it's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon for your final um, event for the year. Mm -hmm. uh, great topic as well, and one that I'm very excited to speak about this afternoon. I think it's really important, so thanks for having me. Indeed, thank you very much, Carmen. It's a pleasure to have you here. So as we begin, smashing that glass ceiling and concrete wall in 2022. As we step into 2022, I believe a lot of us want to achieve great strides, especially in the workplace, in mm -hmm. our lives, as we carry on with our work as entrepreneurs. And it's very important that we do that with the right foot forward. Yes. And so, Carmen, can you, before we step into the crux of, of, of why we're here, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are? your work that you've done in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion all through the nearly 30 years where you've been an advocate and been a voice, a strong voice, especially in this area. So just to tell us a little about yourself. Okay, so I've been in the field of diversity and inclusion now for nearly 30 years. Um, I started working locally, um, in community organizations in the north of England, actually, um, and went to university, took a social science degree, and then really got into diversity and inclusion. One of my, um, one of the main reasons why I did this was because of the injustice that I saw in terms of discrimination, systemic racism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, started doing consultancy. I've worked at government levels across local authority organizations uh, with a government regulator and then went into uh, opening my own consultancy uh, where I um, deliver solutions to global organizations in the area of diversity and inclusion. My specialist area is race and um, anti-racism uh, and as you said before I'm a former Forbes contributor so that's a little bit about me. Well that's interesting you said you, you witnessed a lot of injustice was that specifically in your role in, in, in the private sector or in the public sector? Um, I think both, um, and also at the community level, I was involved with the uh, Stephen Lawrence inquiry, 
when the inquiry meetings was were going around the country mm -hmm. and um initiated a an inquiry meeting in bradford west yorkshire uh, in the late 90s subsequently all of that helped to change the legislation within the uk moving it from the 1976 race relations act to progressively towards the 2020 2010 act that we now have as the uh, equalities legislation in the uk okay and, and with this equality legislation, I think I'm a bit digressing here, but has, have you noticed any massive change both in the public or the, and the private sector since this legislation had been passed or is it still the same? Um, I think it was very much steady as you go um, in 2010. I would say that the public sector at that time was more advanced than the private sector. I think the catalyst for the changes that we are seeing now and the conversations and discussions around uh, diversity and inclusion um, with a specific focus on racism has been since May uh, 2020 and the murder of George Floyd in the United States. I think that along with the Black Lives Matter movement has propelled a more, it has initiated a more focused, um, more focused towards the race and race, racial equity agenda. And I think that although the um, public sector because they have to be strictly aligned towards the law and be seen to be doing something, um, did have a lot in place. I think that the private sector organizations are now trying to look at ways where they can catch up. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, to, to set the foundation for this tonight's talk, can you describe or explain to us the meaning of glass cliffs and concrete walls and why do they exist? Okay, so your glass ceilings, um, I think that term was coined really around gender, uh, women and the glass ceiling, uh, but it's also very relevant in terms of race and racial um, equality. We see that uh, people from Black and Asian and other minority, racial minority groups can be very skilled within their roles, but still end up getting only to that position where all they can do is look up and see the top of the organize, of an organization um, who will be predominantly white. So that's the glass ceiling. And it applies to men as well as women. We can progress so far within the organization, but then it comes to the point where we look up. The concrete wall now is based around systemic racism. You will not break through it because the structures of the organization um, and the, the environment which produces the culture of the organization is a barrier for you. Mm. All of us live within and operate within a, um, an ecosystem, if you like. And that is a culture of the organization, things that have been put in place, barriers that are systemic toward within the organization that prevent diversity from flourishing and prevent um, people of color, mm -hmm. if you like, from progressing within those organizations. So I take it that being systemic, it can be said that this is due to some form of 
unconscious bias that exists either as a culture within a, an organization or biases that exist due to our beliefs, people's beliefs with regards mm -hmm. to race, with regards to people from a certain class, mm -hmm. from a certain type of upbringing. I, I think it's I think it's all of that, boy. But I um, I'm not a, a big fan of unconscious bias, and the reason for that is we can say that okay, it's because of unconscious bias that has led us to the place that we are today. However, take as read that it is unconscious, do leaders and people in leadership positions and managing directors and CEOs, although they stand behind the fact that these are unconscious behaviors, when you look around you, you must see that everyone around you looks exactly like you. So ask the question, how unconscious is this? Because when you look down in the organizations to lower levels, you do actually see quite a lot of people of different colors, different backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. It's when you start moving up the organization and looking at progression within the organization where you see it becomes very um, one-sided, let's say. It becomes very homogeneous. So how can that be unconscious? Oh. What is happening within these organizations and businesses that allows that to happen? Is it that organizations are saying that people of color can't make it to leadership positions? Certainly all the evidence says that that is not correct. Across industries, we have people who have left organizations and gone on to run their own businesses and are very successful at that. So how is it that we can look around and say that something unconscious is happening within these organizations? I hazard a guess that perhaps it's not as unconscious as we're being led to believe. Mm. Mm -hmm. A lot of, there's been a lot of research to show that companies that are diverse mm -hmm. will do 26% all the way up to 31% better than their peers within the same industry. Yes. And from what you said, does it mean that companies that are diverse and are in turn innovative mm -hmm. will typically have a diverse workforce to a certain level within the pyramid mm -hmm. and would not want that diverse workforce to be reflected all the way to the top of the pyramid simply because that threatens their position. So it's almost like a self-preservation at that stage. Absolutely. It, it leads to what I said before, you know, a homogeneous culture that we will welcome people for um, to build the business and to, to you to, to um, support the business to become the best, use the intellectual property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, this organization is going to be run by and is focused on the needs of a particular group of people. So therefore you can see that although the skills and the innovation, et cetera, et cetera, will definitely be multiplied through uh, diversity, 
and those diverse ideas and innovative ideas and all the benefits that diverse workforces bring, we are going to be the owners of the business and we are going to shape the way that the organization is, the way that the organization reacts to internal and external stimulus, stimuli. So what actually happens is there are unwritten rules that suggest that although you can bring your skills and abilities, you will not be able to progress here because leadership is the way we want it to be. We own the power within organizations. Now, when I sit and I speak with um, organizations, both local and globally, these are conversations that I have with leadership. Very often, it is difficult and sometimes uncomfortable for leadership to explain why it is the way it is. Particularly those who purport to be inclusive and value inclusion. Why is it that all the diversity in your business is at the lower levels of the organization? So there are a lot of conversations like that taking place at the moment across industries in an effort to um, support a more inclusive and equitable workplace environment. Hmm. Okay, from your experience, mm -hmm. can you tell us what the main areas of focus should mm -hmm. be for diversity and inclusion? I think learning and development and equitable practice. If we focus on equitable practice within organizations, and supporting, supporting all areas of an organization um, to look at itself introspectively and ask those difficult questions. That will be a most useful activity for organizations. The equitable practice not the speaking, not the we value inclusion statements, to just go on their websites and have a look and see what are people saying when seen when they look at us. If there's an, uh, a, a uh, job application, the first thing people do is go to the website and you know you've got lots of pe pictures of engineers and you know people from all that industry on the website very colorful now let's go to the leadership page it doesn't match so equitable practice is one of the main focuses within the new and improved diversity and inclusion agenda um, that has been given uh, a lot of prominence because of Black Lives Matter and the murder of George Floyd. The next thing would be learning and development. How are organizations, particularly within leadership, um, at leadership level, how are organizations going to learn about diversity and inclusion? Not what they think it is, but what it actually is. So how are they going to to learn and use the lived experience of the people that they claim to be wanting to support. So I think those are two of the main areas of focus at the moment. Mm. Okay, that seems very interesting. Something you mentioned, you go to the website for some of these companies mm -hmm. and what you find is a reflection of diversity across the website. Mm -hmm. But when you now drill or dig deep into their workforce, it is not necessarily reflected across the organization. And, and, and I would say I've, 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 I've been 
I've, I've witnessed one particular company, which I'm not going to call the name. Mm -hmm. And fortunately or unfortunately, I think I, I was at, at a dinner which the, the company organized, and it was 99.1% homogeneous. Mm -hmm. And I felt, I don't think I want to work in this company. Yes. <laughs> because yeah. that's, that's the feeling you automatically have. Mm -hmm. And that means the ability to retain diverse talents will be very minimal, just simply because of the outlook of the company when you go inside. Yes, yes. And I mean, what message does that actually send, Roy? That doesn't send a message that we are, as we claim, an inclusive organization, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if, if um, there's a link to it that can be shared uh, within the chat, but I've re I wrote an a, um, article on forms about on Forbes about performative allyship and that's basically about people claiming that we value diversity and all this kind of it speak really but when you actually look at what's happening there is nothing happening within the organization people will remember job applications that stated we welcome applications from all sections of the community so are we not getting any mm. or are we saying that black engineers are not capable of holding these senior leadership positions because we have to be saying one or the other if the organization is stating that it values diversity, but when you drill down, you are not seeing that diversity, then one has to wonder whether or not this is a performative line that is being taken by the organization. Certainly, the the, la the, the first six months after the murder of George Floyd, long before the trial, what we saw was every organization come out and say that this is abhorrent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why did that happen? These are the questions that I speak with leadership groups about. Why did organizations feel that it was so important to make a statement to distance themselves away from racism. Perhaps because it was felt this will blow over. 18 months later, we're still here. It hasn't blown over. So the leaders that made those statements now have to act on them because the world is aware, the world is changing. Mm. Uh, Generation Zen is not going to live the way that previous generations have um, lived in, in, in organizations where systemic racism is allowed to thrive. It is, it's interesting talking about accountability. Mm -hmm. How can the leaders in these organizations be held accountable but i think we'll, we will get to that question mm -hmm. so now that we've set almost the grounds for how to break the glass at least identifying what the issue is yes i think the next step is how can we increase representation in management level within the industry okay increasing representation is i think two parts to this uh, question it's about recruitment and it's about progression. There's also, that's for the organization, there is also a focus on uh, learning and personal development of Black and other uh, marginalized groups within the industry. But for the, um, so that, that's like personal accountability for one's own career. 
um, and getting the skills and everything thing to be able to um, progress within these organizations. However, in terms of recruitment, there's the old story that, oh, we just can't find the talent. You know, we look and we put advertisements out and uh, black and Asian engineers just don't apply for them or we can't find anyone in, you know, from those backgrounds who are good enough for the position. If that is a take that an organization, if that's what an organization is saying, then certainly all the evidence points to that, yes, the talent is out there. That's number one. And number two, what are your systems for attracting, retaining, and progressing Black and other marginalized groups within your organization? Within that, you will find the answer. So I think that's a lot around increasing representation within the industry for um, black and other racially minoritized staff i think that nothing will come to you if you do not demand it if you have the skills and abilities for myself personally one of my roles as a responsible um professional is to bring people behind me. I do do a lot of mentoring um, of people, um, both in terms of how to get to leadership, but around diversity and inclusion as well. That is one of the solutions that I offer through my company. We have that responsibility to pave the way for the generations of engineers who will come after us. So I think it's, it's, it's two-pronged. It's about what the organization can do, but what us as black professionals can do as well. Okay, this is very interesting. I think it, what you're saying is music to my ear. And I think I'll use this opportunity to talk about, so you mentioned learning and personal development. Mm -hmm. And within the AFB leadership program, that's mm -hmm. what we are focusing on. Yes. So we've created a program called Transcend, which we're, yes. we're, we're hoping to roll out at the second quarter of next year. Okay. And it's actually focused on helping people who are within that senior to mid-level um, position. So senior engineers, lead engineers, or lead roles, lead technical roles, lead project manager roles, to progress from that role into um, executive management role. Yeah. And one thing we find is in creating transcend is you have to demand it. And which is in line with what you've just said. Yes. So how do you go about demanding for something, especially when the person who's involved, number one, feels like he doesn't want to ruffle any feathers within mm -hmm. his organization. Mm -hmm. Number two, feels very comfortable mm -hmm. with where he is or she is. Yes. They have a mortgage, they, 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 they have a good pay package and everything, and they just feel like, I'm fine where I am. It's mm -hmm. going to be more responsibilities if I took on management role, which is usually the issues we find mm -hmm. with individuals who are within that particular space yes i mean i think over my years of doing this one of the things that and i do understand it one of the things that i have found is that what what you um refer to as ruffling feathers i don't want to put my head above the parapet i don't want to be seen as you know the black or the asian person who talks about race and then they'll say I have a chip on my shoulder or whatever the case may be. So I'm going to keep my head down. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to do my work. And when something happens, like the murder of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, and all these conversations that are so prevalent within society now, 
I may just put my head up a little bit and say, this is wrong. And then I'll go right back down to where I was. Put my head down, and do my work. The problem with that is what you actually do by doing that is excuse. You <laughs> oh, what happened there? <laughs> Sorry, I think it's um one of the attendees is getting muted now. That's fine. Sorry, just carry on. Um, I think you are muted, Carmen. Right. Okay, doc. Yeah. Is that okay? So I think what actually happens then is that you excuse the behavior that is being perpetuated against you. And I'll repeat that. You excuse the behavior that is being perpetuated against you by not demanding it. If I just do my nine to five and I know that the structure isn't right and I can't progress and, you know, the system just isn't right and is not inclusive. But I do my 40 years. And as you say, I have a mortgage, pay my mortgage, you know, I've got money coming in every, every month. I'm all right, Jack. What happens is when I go out of the door after my 40 years, somebody who looks like me is going to walk into the door and do another 40 years of what I have just done. We all know that it exists. Organizations know that it exists. They can yeah. see that just by looking around. And as an individual, we all must see our responsibility as one of mentoring and supporting the changes that us later on in our careers and new people who look like us coming into the industry can benefit from. So yes, it might be difficult to keep your head down and everything, but a lot of this is about conscience. And this is why I've worked in this field for nearly 30 years. One day I'll depart. I'll depart this field and I'll depart this earth. What did I do? And that's a question that I think everyone, no matter the profession, should ask. What was your contribution to the change that needs to happen? And the answer to that is going to be personal to everyone who is listening to what I'm saying today. It's going to be a personal question, but it's one that needs to be answered. Because if we have systemic, um, if we have structures that do not um, allow us, because of barriers, etc., to be the best of ourselves within these frameworks, what is going to happen is we will never achieve our um, full selves. And I think that we all have a responsibility to do that for ourselves so that we can get the best out of our careers and for people who are coming through the door behind us. Yeah. I mean, you've said something that has even touched me personally because far too often we find that we are trying to put in effort, especially within AFBE, mm -hmm. to make our voice heard, to bring about change, to have these conversations, but not just have these conversations, but to actively work with organizations to try and review their systems, their recruitment systems, mm -hmm. and, things, and things like that. But far too often, we find that we are our own problem as well, because now you've talked about personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Some of us don't care about that. 
Mm-hmm. It's sad to say, but some people don't want to contribute to the conversation that is at the forefront. They don't want to, like you say, they excuse the behavior that is perpetrated against us. And they excuse Um, this by removing themselves mm -hmm. or not contributing to a collective voice. Okay, now, I agree with that 100%, but there are many reasons for that. Not everyone can be a Carmen Morris, and there are many of me out here. Microaggressions, racial microaggressions, are things that have an impact on people. People are scared. People don't want to contribute for fear of. I think that we are in a place, we're, we're at a place, in our history now where collectively we can make a change. People do not have to stand up as individuals or extremely small groups anymore, like we used to have to do in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. This is a global effort. This is an organizational effort. This is where we must work with leadership to inform the trajectory where we, that we want to see within organizations. And may I say within our industries, because if you work in an organization, in an industry, it is your industry because you are contributing to that industry through your education, you are contributing to it through your time, as you develop within the organization through your expertise, you're contributing. You must contribute to the conversation that is going to make your experience within that organization and you know the, the industry that you contribute your intellectual property to it is your responsibility to contribute to the change and this is very important because if you're not willing to contribute who do you expect to contribute you are the ones who understand what it means to be black in your industry You live and breathe that every day. You may live and breathe it for the next 40 years. If that is the industry that you um, intend on spending your life, ask yourself with all conscience, if your son or your daughter or your niece or your nephew comes to you and says, daddy, mommy, uncle, auntie, I want to be an engineer. What's the first thing you're going to say to them? Oh, it's a great, um, it, 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 it's, it's a great uh, career choice and blah, blah, blah. And wholeheartedly be an engineer. Or are you going to say it's a great career? You work well, you'll do well. But you may not achieve what you seek to achieve no matter how hard you work, because the barriers are there to block you. So as you said, you know, not wanting to contribute, it is for yourself. Some people may choose, look, give me 40, 50, 60,000 a year, and I'm all right, Jack. Think about your kids. Think about the future of people who look like you within the industry. Some deep words there. Now, talking about individual responsibility, because as it sounds, we're responsible to the industry. Mm -hmm. We're responsible to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're responsible for posterity. Children are coming after us. Mm -hmm. Now, 
what steps can we take as our own individual responsibility to increase that diversity and promote inclusion in senior management level? What steps should we take? What challenges are we going to overcome? What stereotypes should we dispel mm -hmm. as we try to progress into this leadership roles? Okay, so for that, I would say all of them and the rest. We all know what they are. We live and we breathe them every day. I think the challenge is, how do you work with leadership? How do you get that message across? I've been here for 10 years, for 15 years. I've applied for roles. I don't get them. Why is that? I have everything, I've got the experience, but I'm not getting it. Can we have a talk about your recruitment and progression within this organization? It's all over the website. And we put out these things about this company being inclusive, but it's a lot more than establishing a, a black um, network, a diversity network. It's a lot more than having conversations about ourselves. It is about that dialogue with the leaders within the organization that is going to shape the future of that company in a world that is not going to sit back and just say, well, I'm black, so I'm not going to achieve anything, but I'll be satisfied with that for the next 40 years. It's about having that dialogue with the leaders in the organization. It's about challenging the leaders of the organization who are saying that, yes, we support inclusion, all the statements that were made in May of last year. I mean, everybody did it. Was that performative? Was that something that you just said to take the eyes away from your organization or take the eyes away from your industry? Because there's been an awakening now, uh, you know, around systemic racism except, at, at all levels of the organization. Of, 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 sorry, of, of industry. There's been an awakening now. What can you do? Open those dialogues. Make those demands. Challenge leadership and, you know, the industry in general to understand and build in solutions to remove systemic racism and structural barriers. Do it for yourself and do it for the next generation. This is an opportunity. This is an opportunity that us as individuals can take to shape the trajectory of our careers. And it's all about that systemic, those systemic barriers that preclude you as an individual from moving up the career ladder, from getting those leadership positions. And if you don't do it at that level, you'll go to the organ another organization, it will be the same thing. Interesting. Uh, what it seems to me is there needs to be some some level of communication to change the blueprint within organizations. Absolutely. And, and, it, and it's very critical that we take that personal responsibility seriously. Now, yeah. uh, there's a lot of questions, well, uh, contributions on the, on, the, on the chats and a lot of them having contributions from someone says must be nice to be uncomfortable while holding onto the access to those senior leadership uh, roles. However, there's a question here from, from Oli. 
there is sometimes a deeply held belief in the myth of black or BME incompetence. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's also a reason why there is that underrepresentation? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it brings me back to what I said earlier around unconscious bias. We can say, oh, um, yeah, well, it is the way it is, but it's unconscious. We didn't mean it to be that way. But if we look back historically, I mean, and let's take it back to slavery. Black people were not about doing very much in terms of the homogeneous leadership group, i.e. slave master, than picking cotton or working in the fields. Now, we are no longer within, you know, the days of slavery, but has that kind of thought process remained? How do you explain it? And these are hard questions. Certainly a lot of the leaders, and I do work with very large global organizations, but it's about whether do you want to change and do you want to have these uncomfortable conversations? It's been easy or easier, much easier to focus on things like gender, which has had huge focus over the past 10 years or so or disability, but that race thing is a bit uncomfortable because how do we really explain the structural racism that is, you know, part of our organization? I'll tell you what, we'll call it unconscious bias. It is like this. It's very unconscious, but guess what? We will change it, we'll make some statements, we'll put some black people on the website, but we will remain as we are. That's not good enough. And a lot of organizations, I'm working with a, a, a very large organization in Europe, it's a global organization, but I'm working with the uh, European arm at the moment. And um, they're, they're a good organization. They want to listen. And if you don't want to listen, you will never learn. Mm -hmm. Learn about the impact of your um, systems from the people that it impacts. But on the same, at the, at the same time, people who are being adversely impacted by those systems must be willing to stand up and be counted. As I said, you know, make a salary, pay your um, mortgage, remember your son, remember your daughter, remember your grandchildren. Because it's not always about, oh, an organization has to do it for us. If they were going to do this, they would have done this decades, centuries ago. It's about you taking your individual responsibility for your own future. I think I have gotten a lot from this talk so far. And one thing that stands out for me is to be able to break through that glass ceiling in 2022, yes. you need to take personal responsibility. Responsibility. Absolutely. Personal responsibility. And I think that applies to everyone, mm -hmm. whether you're black, whether or you're whether white. You're black wherever you come male from, or male female. or female, exactly. You have to take that personal responsibility um, to be able to break through. Now, yes. for people, what, what advice would you give to people who want to progress into this leadership? I, mean, I know we've covered a lot just mm -hmm. now, but what other advice do you want to, if you were to put it in a in a very short form. What other, other advice would you like to give to us? Okay, um, I would say take ownership of your own career trajectory. One of the things that, I mean, I'm of a certain age. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, I've done a lot. I've been around 30 years plus, um, a little bit more. However, 
I've always set smart goals for myself, for my career. My career is owned and developed by myself. So have a continuous development approach for your own career. Set smart goals and evaluate from time to time. What have I achieved in the past year? How far am I towards my goal? So evaluate your career, activate your action plan and rinse and repeat. Keep doing this. When you get to a certain stage, keep doing it. Develop yourself, develop yourself. And that same um, kind of development approach can be used for leadership as well to actively engage with an authentic diversity and inclusion um, pro process or project so that they can embed diversity and inclusion into the, the, the culture of the organization. The second thing I'd say is work hard and know your value. I will say it again, know your value. Value is what you sell to your employer. That's what they pay you for. If you didn't have any value, they wouldn't pay you. So you are essentially offering great value to the organization. So know your value and understand that it's created and owned by you. That is what you're selling to your organization. And for that, it is only fair that you're able to navigate the systems within that organization and progress up the ladder. That's what you need to be working towards. And the last thing I'd say is maintain progress. Don't give up, some days will be bad days. Trust me, I can tell you of a few bad days I've had over my career, but get up, brush yourself off, Tomorrow's another day. It's not going to happen without challenges. But if you want it, you can work for it. You can work with your colleagues for it. You can work with leadership for what you want. But understand your value is created by you. Very wise words, Carmen. I think it's very important, something you mentioned, know your value. Absolutely. And you see, as you continuously progress in your, in your development, as you continuously develop yourself, what happens is that value actually goes up. Yes. And, and what that means is, as your value goes up, in turn, your position should be going up within that organization. Yes. And I will tell you confidently that there's a lot of technical people that I have met personally within the industry who even have the technically skilled, they've got all the qualifications, they've even got an MBA, which a lot of people in executive management positions don't have. Do not have, yes. They've gone through that process of gaining knowledge, mm -hmm. gaining the experience they need, but also understanding the business. And yet they still face this barrier. And that's why I like your final point. Keep on progressing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, as long as I've been around, I learn something new every day. You're always fine tuning. You're always polishing. You're always progressing. Finally, we have five more minutes. Uh, can you tell us what the industry sector can do? What part can they play mm -hmm. to impact on progressing diversity? within senior management level? Yeah, that's around authenticity. 
it's not about the statements that were made last year in May. It's about the actions. We've had enough time now to have those conversations. Certainly, um, a lot of organizations a lot further on than others, are much further on than others. However, if we're going to do this, we've had the time to say, oh my gosh, what has happened? We then started the conversations. Now is the time to act on those conversations with solutions to actually embed DNI as a culture within the organization. Now, this is going to necessitate having, um, sorry, my screen's about to turn off. Um, this is going to necessitate having um, those conversations with people within your um, employee base who have lived experience around these structural barriers and then putting things in place to remove those barriers. That's what it's about. It's not about having a group, a black group, an Asian group, a this group and that group. That's wonderful and very useful as well because you can cultivate ideas there that will work for those marginalized groups rather than an organization saying, we're going to do this without having had those conversations with the people who these systems affect. So industries need to move now towards action, authentic actions and things that are going to get the work done. We can talk for another 20 years, but if we talk for another 20 years, there's going to be very little action. All the information is already out there. So organizations, leaders, let's move on this. No time like the present. No time like the present. It's interesting. You said that the company and organization, they need to leverage on the experience that they have, people who've faced these challenges within and, the organization. Mm -hmm. And far too often, what I find, which I find very funny, is you see people, an organization appoints a diversity and inclusion officer mm -hmm. who has zero absolutely understanding, absolutely. experience, and knowledge about, about the topic. And I say to myself, how are they supposed to bring about an authentic change? Yes. And that's Absolutely. The, the, the process has to be informed by those who have lived experience of the impact of racism within the workplace. And, you know... For, for anyone who wants to read a little bit more about that, I have a, um, they can go to my website or I have a uh, post on Forbes about uh, microaggressions and the impact of microaggressions. I mean, this is like me saying, um, I am going to lead on a change for white Jewish women. Mm living in Scotland. I have no, I can't lead on that. I can be an ally, but I can't lead on it because I do not experience it. Well, thank you very much, Carmen. I think what we've learned here today will set us on a path mm -hmm. of thoughts where we'll think about what our impact will be in our organization and in the industry mm -hmm. and also our responsibility to ourselves, to posterity and to mm -hmm. the industry that we find ourselves in. Yes. Thank you very much. This is certainly not the last we'll be seeing of Carmen. We will be having more sessions with Carmen next year. And for more sessions, speaking about that, we will be having in 2022 NDs of companies of multi um, national organizations who will be coming to speak at the leadership talk show. 
and you'll be surprised and amazed at the number of people we'll be getting. I'm, I'm also excited myself with a lot of confirmed dates. So please watch this space. And for those of you who will be seeking for jobs, especially in the area of manufacturing, there's a new opportunity where the Scottish government wishes to create a diverse workforce, specifically in the manufacturing sector. And if you're interested, there's a talk on that on the 9th of December. If you mm -hmm. go to our AFBE UK website, you'll be able to find all information there. It's on the 9th of December, and this is for people who want to either go into the manufacturing sector or just want to change and transition roles into the sector. Also, I want you to look out for next year, we will be launching our Transcend Leadership Program, where we'll be offering training to senior people within the industry, senior people of color. It is a very short space, a limited number of spaces. And this is a high level program to help people think about a lot of the topics that we've had on this leadership talk program and also think about what they want to be doing for their own personal development. So thank you very much to everyone who's made it to this leadership talk show. I wish you a lovely Christmas and a new year coming. Carmen, thank you very much again for very well gracing us. It is a pleasure to have you. And I look forward to a panel session next year, which I, I trust me is going to be exciting. Real yes. talks are going to be heard there. And to Bumi, thank you for helping out with, with the admin side of it. Thank you to everyone. And I look forward to seeing you next year, February is when we will kick off the leadership talk show. I look forward to seeing all of you there next year. Have a good year, have a good December, a good Christmas, and a good year ahead. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.